people don't to suffer. The thing they make us die. Our mumu don't do it. Our mumu don't do it. They promise them they fail. Take it back. Action. Take it back. Action. They promise them they be like we do. Action. Take it back. Action. Take it back. Election is here again. And here we go again. But there is one man who can help us to get through this. A man who speaks the truth. Transparency, reflecting his delay. He has promised to help Nigeria and you do. I'm a yellow shower. I'm a yellow shower. I'm a yellow shower. I'm a yellow shower. Because this movement is about taking it back. That's right. This is not about him. Yeah. This is about your country. That's right. This That's is right. about my country. That's right. This is about a place you can say one day, thank you, America. Mm. I've had enough. Wow. It's time for me to go back home. That's right. I remember when we were going up, we said, Ide la Bosinyoko. But those people, they turn Ile to Oko, and they turn Oko to Ile. Because when I left, I left, I planned to be in America for only four years. And I can tell you people that have the same story. 35 years later, it's still counting. But I know now, the time is up. Yes. My 35 years will soon be up. When I can go home and call home a retirement place. But how can we do it? It's in your hands. The youth is your country. If you see people treat the Washington and every one of them, how old are they when they took the revolution and come to this country and establish the country? Today, we are proud of the country. How many of you are proud of Nigeria? How many? So, what we are doing today is bigger than Shogure. It's bigger than every one of us. It's about the country. We are not talking about political party. We are talking about a movement. A movement is something that when you start, you cannot quit. Mm, that's right. And the way I know this man, he's not a quitter. Right. He has seen it all. He has seen what most of us have never seen. And he's still pushing. So I pray that we have the courage. But let me tell you one thing. He doesn't have a godfather. You know who is his godfather? You. Every one of you sitting down are his godfather. And how do you become his godfather? That's the reason why we are here today. You see, we don't cook rice. We don't cook all those things. It's not about rice. We want to have a day where we go back to Nigeria and eat rice and chicken on Sunday. And we can have places like butter shoe where we can buy our butter so we don't have to go to Bendam Boutique in Marina. Do you know what Benda, Benda Boutique is? These are the used clothes of other people. So, we, Taje Omo Awan Jebu, we need to let that stop. And how do we do it? We have an envelope, $50, $100, $1,000. Let me tell you, this will be the best investment you will ever make in your life. I promise you that. God bless you all. So we, we interact. Yeah. And when we say take it, you say take it back, you said action. When we say action, you say take it back. So what it means is this action. We want to take it back. 
You can't take something back without taking an action. That's right. You understand what I'm saying? If if there is if there is a million dollar under this building now, they bury it here. If they tell you the money is there, if you don't go to action, you can't take it. Right. It will be sitting there. So it's the best movement <clears throat> ever. And I can promise you, when you talk of someone who has the tenacity, who is very bold, who is not afraid to talk to power, <clears throat> when I say talk to power, talk truth to the power. And those people, they are afraid. These people are scared. You know why? Because they have everything to lose. Poor people don't have anything to lose. They were afraid. When they know you want it back, they will take whatever they have and run. And the one we caught, we will cut them and do what we need to do. And those who escape, we find a better time to get one of them. So thank you once more. I will introduce to you here. Uh, I will let them introduce themselves because... Like I told you people, I'm a very passionate person. Uh, my president to be. Have I ever met you before? No. Did you know me? No. Okay. <laughs> we met for the first time today. But we are the people that when you know good things, you will see a good thing you will know is good. And I told him when I was in California, I said, if we have to die, we will die together. You know what his answer to me? He said, we are not going to die because that's not why we want to take it back. <laughs> that's what he said. To see how bold. He's very bold. And I see he has some other things to say, man, because I love to talk. He loves to talk. I love it when I see people who are ready to walk. I don't like people who doesn't want to walk. Mouth will not do it. But let's dip our hands into our pocket. $100, $500, it will be the best investment you will ever make. In about three, four years from now, <clears throat> nobody will ever call you from Nigeria to send dollar to them anymore <laughs> because they will have more dollar. It's your investment. Nice. And then the party is registered. www.aacparty.org. Um, Go every information, register your family members, do everything you need to do to make it a success. This party will not go to bed with strange fellows. They want it to happen, but it will not happen. When you are sure of yourself, in your balan, when you are sure of yourself, you don't need anyone. It's in the old days that a tree cannot make a forest. You plant a tree, the seed will drop on the ground, it will germinate, other will drop, and from one tree, you will build a forest. Right. This is a tree that is about to build a forest in Nigeria. So I will leave this podium to have Mr. Uh, Dr. Fabi yes. Marco yes. to introduce himself and introduce our next president of Nigeria. Thank you back. Action. Thank you back. Action. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, my name is Dr. Malcolm Fabini, and I have the singular honor and privilege of being the person that has been supporting the work of Omoyele Showard, the Take It Back movement, and now the AAC, the African Action Congress. Take it back! Action. Action. Take it back. Action. Take it back. Action. Action. Take it back. Has anybody seen the logo of our party? <laughs> what is the logo of our party? <laughs> it's two hands <laughs> free in the air. Clean hands. Yeah. Clean, hands. <laughs> Clean hands in the air. So please, I, I, I want to please ask you, if you don't mind, to please stand up and let us do this right. Please stand up. So when we say, take it back, action. Take it back, action. Take it back, action. Action, take it back. Please be seated. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I will not take too much time, but I, I crave your indulgence to tell you a little bit about Omoyele Shoure. And I want to share what I know about him uh, for just a moment with you. He's, he's a known commodity. 
we all know him. He doesn't need any introduction. But what I'm going to tell you today is a testimony from somebody who has known Shoele for 30 years. I got into the University of Lagos in 1990. At that time, Shoele was already had already been in school for one year. And for those of us who had just arrived, if there was one name that was already starting to make waves, it was the name of Shore. There's nothing this man is doing today that he was not doing 29 and 30 years ago. Whether it was the anti sap riots of 1989, whether it was determining and deciding that there was no way that we would be fighting against terrorists in government and allow terrorists to terrorize us on campus in the name of cultists, whether it was going out and being the arrowhead of the struggle against the annulment of June 12. He was barely out of his teenage years. If I remember correctly, you were probably about 20 or 21 years old when, when uh, the June 12, when June 12, when the June 12 crisis hit. And while everybody else was silent, and if you remember that period, if you go back to that period, all of our heroes had to leave the country. Most of our leaders were in exile. Those who stayed, many lost their lives. Pa Alfred Rewani, Madame Kudirat Abiola. In that atmosphere, in that period, where even men were afraid to speak, it took boys, young men, of courage to stand up and say this wasn't going to happen. He was one of the arrowheads. In fact, he was the principal arrowhead of the student and youth action during that period. So whether it was what he was doing on campus 30 years ago, whether it was what he started doing about 12 years ago when he established Sahara Reporters. For, so for those who never got to know Shoure from the work that he was doing as a student and youth activist about 30 years ago, they came to understand what Shoure stands for. Over the last 12 years, where for many of us here, for how many people knew, got to know Shore through the work in Sahara Reporters? Okay, so, so quite a few people here. So the reality is, when you see consistency, when you look at the leaders in our country, many of the leaders in our country are barely, you know, they are, yes, we have a lot of older people, but the truth of the matter is, Many of the people that are terrorizing that country are also between their 40s to their 60s. They are also young. They were in school when we were in school. When June 12 was annulled, if you love Nigeria so much, when Nigeria was being terrorized, where were you? Where were you? When the military was chasing us up and down, when the military was terrorizing Nigerians, when democracy was being trampled, 20, 30 years ago, when you were in your own 20s and in your 30s, where were you? When Kudi Rat Abiola was being killed and people went into the streets and said we would not stand for this, where were you? When Babangida annulled a legitimate election, when Abacha took over and perpetuated that annulment, where were you? So there is something to consistency. If you've been in the army for 30 years, you would be a general by now. And I want to say this man is a general. No doubt. He is absolutely a general. He has always consistently been on the side of truth. It has cost him a lot. Many of us know the stories. Many of us know he has been harassed, arrested, detained, rusticated, expelled, then rusticated again. But here he is today. 
successful in every way. And I think uh, what your story, you know, anytime I think about about your and, and again, I'm, I'm privileged to be to be able to call him a friend and a brother, is it, it just his story tells me that truth and justice eventually prevails. His story tells me that anything is possible if we truly believe. This man created a global media empire that CNN and BBC reference with a $600 computer in the basement of a building in New York. With no godfathers, no godmothers. And look at where we are today. Just like he has always done, he came up and said, look, it's time to take it back. And when Sohore tells you things, you you stop and you listen. Because when somebody has been consistently right for 30 years, you know, the second time might be a coincidence. But when somebody has consistently seen the trends, when somebody consistently understands what is going on within a nation, you take him seriously. And look at where we are today. He has led, first of all, convened a movement, the Take It Back movement. That movement is in every single country around the world today. Right. Hundreds of thousands of members around the world. Here you are today. This is a Friday evening in, 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 in Texas. You could be anywhere, but you've chosen to spend your time with him. You've chosen to invest this time in Nigeria. So what I'll say to you is that what we have created, what he, through his leadership, what we've been able to do is to, first of all, you know, birth a movement, as I said, a movement that has, that is incredibly powerful, that has been able to, to speak truth to power, that has been able to make the power structure sit up for the first time in many years. And then what, under his leadership, we've also been able to do is to ensure that for the first time in our nation's history, we have a party that is built based on ideology. There was a time when we had ideological parties. That was way, way, way in the 50s and the early 60s. For those of you that are here, if I tell you somebody is a Democrat, you can immediately describe about 80% of what that person believes in. You know what they believe about social issues. If I tell you somebody is a Republican, you know their views about social issues as well. If you go to the UK and you say somebody belongs to the Tory party, you can immediately understand some of their views about the role of government in healthcare, for example. In our country, when somebody tells you he's in the APC, <laughs> you know that he is a candidate for which party? The PDP. <laughs> it means absolutely nothing, but that is not how democracy should work. So one of the fundamental reasons why it became important, look, a party is just a vehicle, but not any type of engine can move a vehicle. Every vehicle needs the appropriate engine. And under Shore's leadership, what has happened is that this movement, which is the engine of the struggle, has found an appropriate vehicle in our party platform. And the idea that you wake up today and you are in PDP, you wake up tomorrow and you are in APC, that will never, we should never allow that to become normal. Because there is nothing normal about it. Take it back. Take it back. Action. Take it back. Action. Action. There's nothing normal about that. There's nothing normal about it. And we should never normalize things that should not be normalized. So what the party has allowed us to do, and it was very insistent from the beginning, someday the true story, the story of how this came about will be told, that it was going to be extremely important to have a party platform that would ensure that every single dream, every vision that he has for that country can be actualized. A party that truly reflects the yearnings and aspirations of the Nigerian people. 
So without further ado, um, I know we'll have a lot of opportunities later to, to have uh, more, more discussions, but I will want to bring, very, I'll bring to the podium soon the person we're here to see. But what I'll say before he comes on is that if I describe the movement as the engine and I describe the party as the vehicle, Every, whether if you have an engine, put an aeroplane engine in a car, it is not going anywhere without, without what? We have a driver, is the driver? Without fuel, we need gas. Take it back. Take it back. We need gas. And what is gas? It's money. So, if you don't want Saraki to be your godfather, I would rather have you be our godfathers than to have people whom we know do not care for that country to be the ones dictating what is going on. Because you are here sacrificing. The sacrifice you are making by being here today tells me that you are concerned about that country. Because Nigeria is not doing anything for you right now. Yeah. But you are here. So what that tells me is you care about that country. And I would rather, we would rather, that the Nigerian people be the ones that will put gas in this car. We would rather that the Nigerian people be the ones that will put engine oil in this engine. So, he will come, Shore will come and talk to you. He will tell you his visions and his plans for the country. He will answer your questions. But at the end of the day, what I'm asking you, I will come back here and I will make this specific request. That the only way this is going to happen, the only way we're going to make this work, the only way we're truly going to take it back, is if you and I dig deep into our pockets. If we make the necessary sacrifices and make the commitment to support this effort, not just today, but tomorrow and in an ongoing fashion, until by the special grace of God and by the power of the Nigerian people on February 16, 2019, we chase those people out of power and restore to the Nigerian people a government that they truly deserve. Thank you, I bring, I bring to the stage of Moyele Shogore, the convener of the Take It Back movement, the chairman of the African Action Congress. Take it back! Take it back! Take it back! Take it back. Action! Take it back! Thank you. Thank you. Please have your seat, please. Oh, man. Um, I cannot go on without telling you a little bit of Malcolm's story as well. <laughs> yes. Yes. Since he's outed me, I'm going to out him too. Tell us everything. But in a good way. So, <laughs> I was expelled from the University of Lagos twice. My first expulsion, Malcolm had not. I think he was on campus, but he was not part of the students I was expelled because he was a new student. I think it was around 1992 that was our first exposure. He was a very serious student. He was a first class student in chemical engineering department and the faculty of engineering at the University of Lagos. So when the next list of students to be expelled came up, Mark Holmes' name featured prominently in it. And of course, my name also featured prominently, usually around number one or two. That's where I usually <laughs> hover. And the University Senate had a meeting. The Senate is the final decision maker for students to be expelled from the university. And one of the professors, as they read the names of the expelled students to be expelled, said, please, I have an objection. How do you expel a first class student in chemical engineering without destroying Nigeria? <laughs> and they were referring to Malcolm. When my name came up, they said, No, that one is <laughs> been expelled before. I don't, we don't even know how he made it back. And uh, it is very important that we know today that even though Malcolm was expelled at that time, when we all went back to the university, if Malcolm had been expelled forever, Nigeria would have been destroyed. Reason is this. Malcolm left the University of Lagos to go and become a PhD student 
at Cambridge University. I think before he turned Ted, right? And he has an MBA. I cannot read how many degrees he's got to you. These are the kind of people that we've been working with in the last six months in our Take It Back movement. And that is the reason why you see the quality of the movement in a way that has not been seen anywhere before. First class. First class. He is still the first class material where I remain where I am the day I was taken to the Senate. But we are moving from that level to a different level for Nigeria. And that level that we are in now is to move Nigeria to that place where if Nigeria is not doing anything for you, Nigeria is also not hurting you. The truth today is that you are in Texas, right, in Dallas, and it's true that Nigeria is not doing anything for you. But Nigeria is doing something against you, wherever you may be, as long as you are in Nigeria. In fact, even when you get the American citizenship, their passport, there's a blue chip inserted in it. The moment it rings Nigeria, they look at you differently. The reception becomes generally hostile. The attitude becomes very suspicious. And since in Nigeria, what has he brought again? Is it with money that he stole from somewhere? Is he planning to do something horrible in America? That is the reaction you get because while Nigeria is not doing anything for you, Nigeria is doing something against you. If you have a country to which you cannot take your children for vacation, your own country, if that country is not doing something for you, it's doing something against you. If you have a country in which you cannot be sure of the security of lives and property of your family members and relatives, even when you are here, if the country is not doing something for you, it's doing something against you. If you have a country that you cannot be proud to tell your colleagues at work or your social circles that I'm from Nigeria, if that country is not doing something for you, it's doing something against you. And we are determined to end that era. Malcolm mentioned something that had me thinking very seriously as I sat there and he was delivering his very powerful speech here. And that is where we are experience-wise and where we are experience on the other side. The kind of people that Nigeria has given the opportunity to run Nigeria, the kind of people that have been denied the right to live peacefully in a progressive Nigeria. It turns out that people who fight for Nigeria are usually the people that Nigeria turns its back against. And the people who ruin Nigeria are the people rewarded. So the Nigerian reward system is warped to the extent that the way to make it to the top in Nigeria is to be crooked. The way to make it excellently in Nigeria is to be destructive. The way to make it in Nigeria is to be a thief. If you steal very well, the likelihood that Clive Boyatle, that you can become a Senate president, <laughs> is higher than the person who has never stolen before. That's right. That's right. If you plan the coup against democracy in Nigeria, the likelihood that you can return to become the president of Nigeria is higher than an officer who foiled the coup. That's right. If you are a student who doesn't who don't cheat in exams, the likelihood that you will not make it, and the guys who didn't write exams will become the vice chancellor of the university is higher in Nigeria today. Right. Our value system is completely destroyed. Right. Our mentors and heroes are the criminals amongst us. Mm -hmm. And we celebrate them openly. We celebrate them in our religious places, even in our traditional places. The bad guys, as we like to call them, are the ones you know, holding sway. And they get more and more emboldened every day. In every election circle, the candidates that are presented are the worst amongst us, or the candidates that present themselves. That is where we are again in 2018 and now looking at 2019. But what is different about 2019 for us is not just that it's another date on the calendar of misery in Nigeria. 
It is because it will be 20 years since we returned Nigeria to democratic rule. And something has to give 20 years after yes. that will change the narrative and the story of our democratic experiment or experience. You see, it has gotten so bad that people whose only experience in Nigeria is stealing, killing and maiming people, we point to those of us who fought for the democracy in Nigeria and tell us that we have no experience. <laughs> right? And they do so with audacity. They do so with impunity. They look at you and say, oh, so we're Go and be local government chairman. You are not even qualified to be councillor. The guy who used to be a bank robber when I was a student union leader fighting for democracy in 1993-1992. Ask yourself, the people around Nigeria today, where were they in 1993? Right. If you look at the history of Nigeria, you can actually find records of what they were doing. Mostly bad things. Those are the ones that Nigerians point to as some Nigerians, not all of us, as being experienced and qualified to run the country. Those of us who have never been on that line of remuneration that is being paid and are paying ourselves for doing what is right, we have been told that we're not qualified, that we should go and start from the local government. We should go and start from councillorship. Go and start. Some of them will say generously, we want to be generous with you, we will allow you to do House of Rep Representative. And we are saying to them, we want to change Nigeria, we are not going to change it from the councillorship of the local government. Right. We are going to change it from the presidency of Nigeria. Right. Because, yes, because we are more qualified. In fact, you know, sometimes people will say to me that maybe I'm speaking with too much confidence. And sometimes when you have too much, I mean, great confidence, people refer to it as arrogance. There's a difference between confidence and arrogance. I am confident that I'm qualified at the age of 47 going to 48 to run Nigeria better than the jokers have been running the place all these years. And it is the truth, the fact I refer to when I was a, I think we came to this game very late. We should have been running for the presidency of Nigeria since 1992. <laughs> because by 1992, we could confidently stand in the middle of the marketplace and profess or, you know, speak to a Nigeria of the future that we want to see. And that has come to pass. Our prediction in 1992-1993, standing behind Abiola saying that Nigeria would experience democracy one day, has come to pass. So who would you rather choose? The guy that fought for the democracy or the guys that were against democracy? Because if you look at several of our political leaders today, they were the guys who could knife with Baba. In fact, today, they still go to Mina to genuflect on the altars of the fallen god there, Ibrahim Babangira. They see God there. Because that is their God. And their God, or their Godfather, is the guy who his entire life worked against the future that we have come to enjoy now in Nigeria. So, as I am standing in front of you today, I want to reiterate that we're here to fundraise. That is the truth. And fundraising, as Marco said, is a chemical engineer. So that's why he was using gasoline experience, you know, uh, uh, analogy to describe what we are. You know, I am more of a physician. I, I, I think about, you know, stepping on the gas pedal. And you know, the more gas you have, the faster you can go. So we urge you to support this movement. When we ask you to support this movement, we are not asking you to support us. We're asking you to support an aspiration that will take Nigeria to the future. I mean, way into a future that you all will be proud of. That's what our brother said here when he told you that this might as well be the best investment we can make. It doesn't mean that your penny stock investments are not investments. No, 
He's just telling you categorically that the best investment may be that investment in Africa's best resource, the people of Nigeria. What Nigeria has got today is not oil. I tell people, oil is going to fade in the next few years. But there's something about Nigeria that is powerful, the people of Nigeria and their spirits. Right. That can do spirit that no matter how much you suppress them, they somehow keep waking up and hoping for the best. No matter how they have been trampled upon, they stand up and keep going, hoping that one day they'll be able to climb out of poverty and misery. And we have gone around the country and seen that this is possible. We don't even need to go around the country to know that this is possible because we are the possibility that Nigeria needs to experience the progress and prosperity and development that it needs very badly. We are the ones that can make it happen. We know how to make it happen, but we've been held back. Instead of making it happen, so many of us left the country. And we are here today, well, in another man's country. But the question we should ask ourselves is that as we feel secure here in America, is it not because somebody invested in America's future? Exactly. As you are feeling good, sometimes, and I know most times you don't feel good about staying here. I can tell you that for free. It is because some people made the sacrifice. Some people sat down one evening in the southern part of the U.S., defied the police, their dogs, defied discrimination, and it is the reason why even black people, people of our skin color, can live in this country today. So what do you lose if you do that for your home country? Because you and I know that no matter how great America is, you are just here as part of the statistics of people who live here. The question you should ask yourself, is if America is so great that sometimes its own people are frustrated within America, how much more you who just came a visitor and you run your own circle, right? You know, you have the big cars, you buy a home, you have children, and then your children go to Nigeria twice, maybe your lifetime, and then one day the children are tired of you, they put you in an old people's home, right? Or maybe you die, they just go home for the last time to bury daddy and they'll never go back home again. Because Nigeria is not the kind of place they are looking forward to going back to because they've destroyed Nigeria. And the condition of Nigeria that you are seeing today is a social experiment that is meant to scare everybody away from Nigeria. The people who are doing it have no plan to renovate or redesign or redistribute wealth in a way that will make Nigeria a fantastic place to live. If they had a plan, they would have been implementing it now. If they had a plan, they would have been doing it since they've been coming to power. Because as you know today, so many of Nigerian leaders are older than Nigeria. So if they have solutions to Nigerian problem, as older people, even culturally, they would have applied it. But they have no clue and they have no desire or design to lift Nigeria out of poverty and misery. They rather keep Nigeria this way so that Nigeria can keep going to them, asking for help. And sometimes I must tell you that I wonder what is wrong with us, by the way, Nigerians, why we keep going back to the same people who put us in this condition to seek help. I have been buffeted with requests. I cannot tell you how many of them. Please go and see your vast job. Can you stop by Babangida's house? Eh? Can you go to Abusalam just say hello to him? Those are the people who control Nigeria. If you don't go to them, we don't know. And I have to stand up to this people and say, what, what, does, what will my going to Abusalam's house do for Nigeria? Oh, he's an elder statesman. Are you the one who made him elder statesman? Or he named himself elder statesman? If he's an elder statesman, is this, if anybody who had run the country this way is not supposed to be an elder statesman, 
is supposed to be in jail. But Bangida, I said, any day, anywhere should be in prison for a variety of offenses he committed against Nigerian state. In fact, Buhari should be in prison because they carried out coups that made it impossible for Nigeria to experience democracy the way or time it should have. But in Nigeria, we keep going back to them. And for those of us who don't go back to them, people keep saying, ah, you know, don't you think, maybe, you know, they keep giving you excuses why you should go back to your own oppressors. And I just would not do it, ladies and gentlemen. We are all going to die. Thank you, man. Yes. Thank you, man. Action. We are going now to you. That's right. Yes. We have elected and appointed new godfathers and godmothers. But they are not the type that are very, very diabolical. They are the normal ones, you know. And I'm using that just generically. We do not subscribe to the godfatherism that you know of, where someone sits down as the party big wig or chieftain, as they call it, or stakeholder, whichever one it is. Whichever of those appellations they use to describe them and determines who goes where. That's not what, that's the reason we started our political movement first and it became a political party. And you must have to thank our very, very hard working people that in the history of Nigeria, so which Malcolm did not mention, we started a movement that had global impact within six months. And within six months, we registered a, a political party that also immediately took off as a global political party. And it's not only that, we are almost the first digital party out of Nigeria, where all Nigerians, wherever they may be, can join the party, can contribute to their own ideas, can even indicate which offices they want to run for, on the internet without leaving the comfort of their computers. Action. Can make contributions to the party wherever they we are the first political movement in the history of Nigeria to crowdfund to the amount of money that we raised. That's not what we want. But I'm just telling you the first, 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 first things we have done. And we will be the first political party of young people without godfathers to become the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you, man. Thank you. We will be the first to take our country back. And that is why we have come today to you in Dallas to ensure that you do not relent in granting the support that you have. We you know so many of you have uh, donated to us on GoFundMe, and some of you even through relatives with whom you've shared the great story of, of, you know, of our effective and monumental you know, uh, mobilization effort and energy that has not been equal anywhere. But we want you to keep doing more until that moment that we get our country back and we put that country in a different path that will make you all be proud of Nigeria. Yes. Nigeria right now is not a country you can be proud of. I'm not afraid and I'm not ashamed to say it. I have just returned from Nigeria last week. Right? The depression in Nigeria starts from the airport as you are leaving. Your depression starts as you are arriving at the airport. Every other thing you see after that is depressing. Is it the roads you are driving? or the fact that even as you are arriving at your homes or if you have relatives, as you are walking into the place, they switch off the electricity. And even when you have the thing they call generators, a better pass, you know, is it my own better pass, you know, as they call it, my, 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 my better pass, my neighbor. Even at night with generator and gas, in several parts of Nigeria, you cannot turn, you dare not turn them on because that would then attract criminals to come and rob you or kidnap you, whichever one. So it's gotten to a point that even when you have money in Nigeria, you cannot spend it when you want. Even when you have luxury, 
you cannot display it as you want. In fact, it makes you start to think that the leaders of Nigeria have mental problems. As I say, why would you live in a country where you have cars and you have no roads upon which to drive them? Mm -hmm. If you are not mentally challenged, you know, if you don't have a mental challenge of, you know, a mental condition, the first thing you should have done is to build the roads first, and then we can bring in the cars later. Mm -hmm. so at least you'll be able to drive it. What sense does it make to have Mercedes Benz at home? And then at night, you still have to go and buy a B2 for you to travel at night. <laughs> so that you can disguise from the criminals in the society that you created. So we can keep going on and on like that, but that is not going to solve our problem. The solution to the problem is right now in front of you. I think some of you probably had a different story about us a month ago. Everybody was asking, where is their party? Where is your party? Where is your party? Now, we've got a party. And we've got a party that is not only, not only are we in control of the party, but you are also in control of the party. It's not a party in which there's a godfather somewhere who is selecting and appointing and deciding on who should be party leaders, candidates. This is your own party. Not only do we have a party at this point, but we have a party also that is recognizable. Even if someone is an illiterate, you can find our party, you know, after you look at the first three parties on the ballot paper next year. It's AAC. If two other parties ahead of us provide or produce presidential aspirants, that is a party with letter A in the end. It's a party with letter AA. We are AAC, we are number three on the ballot. If they don't produce presidential candidate, I think we'll be number one on the ballot, which will make it very easy for a lot of people who don't like to read and write. We just tell them go to that party number one. So that's it. Mm -hmm. yes. Just take action and before you know it, uh, it will make things very easy. We are not saying it to confuse people, but it's because it's the right party, we have the right message, and we have the right agenda and programs that will make Nigeria become a fantastic country. We know that Nigeria can become a fantastic country. We know that it is not impossible to build roads, hospitals, or provide electricity in Nigeria. So many of you who have lived here for so many years, I don't know how many times you passed a construction job and they told you we're done in three months and you come back to the weeks later, it's completed. Nigeria, if they say something is going to be done in six months, that is six years. Plus. Plus. If we finish it in six years, you are lucky. Nigeria is the only country where a president, a, a, a government will be spending four years in office. But he will say that the time for the development that he's planning will be another so 10 years after. Babangida was doing Vision 2020 in 1990. No, it's true. Because everything is adjourned and postponed to the time that you cannot hold them accountable for it. Exactly, and it's right, they were describing him as a genius. There's no genius in criminality. Yes, and that is the reason why we have assembled some of the best hands. We're just waiting to unleash them on Nigeria, and you'll be surprised. And how do you know that we're capable of doing this? Just look at the way our party grew within a short time, with little money. We don't, you know, we traveled in Nigeria to 29 states within six months, traveling some of the most dangerous highways in Nigeria. When we went to Zamfara, our driver was pointing to us. Oh, they just killed 20 people that last week, that place. We drive another 20 miles. Ah, they killed 50 in this place. You know, when we went to Makondi about a week ago, the same thing, we passed a place where 20 people had just been killed by men. That's Nigeria of today for you. But can we change this? Of course, yes. Yes, we can change the situation of Nigeria. 
Yes, we can make Nigeria become your favorite destination to go on vacation. In fact, that is not our agenda. We want you all guys here to return home. Yes. We don't want you to keep using Nigeria to scare your children. Yes. Because that's what Nigeria does for you mostly now. If your children are not behaving well, just say, I'm taking you to Nigeria. I say, Dad, don't take me to Nigeria. What do you want me to do for you? That's, that's the Nigeria we want to bring about. And I don't want to say much more than that. We have to say a lot all the time. But at this point, we are running out of gas. We need gasoline to be able to go back home. I'm returning home next week again. And as you know, the moment we arrive in Nigeria, we hit the ground running. We are reaching out to markets, higher institutions. We are going to the most unlikely places. We visit traditional rulers. And when we go there, we tell truth to power, right? We are holding town hall meetings, but we've reached a level where we need to start having huge rallies. And we have no problem. People are following us for free. Our followers are organic in nature. When we hold rallies, you see it. We don't pay anybody. We don't even give them what they call gala in Nigeria. Gala is transparent bread. In Nigeria, you see the other side of the bread. You know, and then they will put a cream of meat in the middle. That's we don't we didn't give them no Coca Cola, no water. And people will stay until we are done, and they will still be you know struggling to ask questions, struggling to take pictures with us because for them it looks like this is the last opportunity for Nigeria to climb out of poverty and misery. And we have a duty to do it for Nigeria. You see, when you leave here tonight, you are probably going to send money to somebody in Nigeria for some reason. It's either they are doing a wedding or somebody is sick, you are helping to build a community center, you are helping uh, somebody to send their children to school. But maybe it's time for us to pull all of those together and use it to fund a political movement so that we can build the schools so that you don't need to build schools again. Now you can now start building your own houses in Nigeria. You can now start planning your return to Nigeria. We don't want you guys here to end up in old people's home in America. It's not a good place. I'm telling you, I've lived here for 19 years too. And I know what it is. It's incarceration for people that are vulnerable. <laughs> At their older age, yeah, it's true. And your children will put you there in the heartbeats because there's no cultural connection between you and them. They're looking for ways to get rid of you, anyways. My grandmother in Nigeria is 95 years old. She's living with us. There's no plan to put her, there's no old people's home. To, the old people's home for my grandmother is our family house. And everybody's there to take care of her. There's love, there's connection. That's how we are wired. That's how we are built. But the moment you come here, that sanctity of old age is gone. And who amongst you really can honestly feel like you are really happy to be here after a while, right? You know, maybe your first five years. After that, it's a downward spiral. Even when you want to travel, you have to travel within the payment circle of your credit card. You make sure that you travel the last payment and return before the next payment. That's, that's how it is. You know, for your money, you, you are here, you don't own anything. You can own a car. The month or year you refuse to do insurance, they take it from you. You can own a house. The month you don't pay mortgage, the bank reverses it to them. Even if you have paid your mortgage consistently for 30 years, that one last payment, could lead to the loss of your home. You go to Nigeria, it's never like that. You know, I just, I just I don't want to take us to that very depressing part of life, but this conversation is very political for me, but it's also very factual.
that we have a reality that we must also deal with exactly. in our own existence. Exactly. And our existence don't mean nothing if we don't have a country that we can return to. And everybody that is an immigrant in this country is always aiming for their own mother countries to be great so that they can go there. The Italians don't play with Italy. Yes. And the Jews don't play with Israel, even if they are not born over there. Right? Why would Nigerians be, Nigerians be playing with Nigeria when it's, Nigeria is a virgin land? I tell you, there's so much that could be done in Nigeria. Nigeria is like, no, it's not been touched for me. There's so much you can do with experimental development in Nigeria. Because if you still want to build 10 roads out of Lagos, the space is available to do it. If you want to build the fastest train from Lagos to Port Harcourt, the, the place is there, nobody has ever touched it before. It's not as if you need to remove standard gauge and put double gauge. There's no gauge there. So you can go and put your own gauge and the thing will be the fastest. If you want to build an autobahn, the, you know, the highway with the best highway that has no speed limit in Nigeria, there's opportunity to do it. So there's so much to do. We have 18, you know, I think there were 17 million houses to build in Nigeria, right? We have how many people to feed? 198 million people. Maybe that same number of people to clothe. You have 198 million people to provide medical care to. So if you are a doctor in America, you still go back after they have retired you over here, you can still work for another 20 years mm. and you'll be all right. Because the medical knowledge you have that America is challenging with insurance here, you can use it to help somebody <laughs> at home. And nobody's going to, people are going to be grateful to you. Whereas America is being ungrateful to you because you made a mistake or sometimes you didn't even make any mistake. You robbed a lawyer the wrong way. And only you. Home is waiting for you to come do good and nobody will turn against you. But right now if you do, they will turn against you. Right now Nigeria has no space to do good. You bring any idea of progress to Nigeria, they will win you immediately. They come after you. It doesn't matter, you know. They have empowered very wicked people at every level. Every street has got a wicked person. There are people who are responsible for switching off electricity in Nigeria. There are people who are responsible for ensuring that there's no water because they have water making machines, you know, businesses. Right? There are people who are responsible for making sure that the hospitals don't work because they have private hospitals. There are people who are responsible. In fact, there are constructors that will go and destroy a road that is at least manageable because they want to get a contract. Or they want to inflate a contract that is already in existence. That's where Nigeria is today. And without changing the leadership, we are deceiving ourselves. This current crop of leaders have nothing to offer Nigeria. Truth, people, is that you cannot give what you don't have. Thank you very much. Take it back. Awesome. Take it back. Awesome. So let me uh, invite our brother who is uh, the organizer here. Since we are not many, I think we can do a quick introduction of people who are seated in the house. Uh, just to introduce yourself so that we can know you too next time. When we see you on the plane heading back home after we win. <laughs> you can you say, hey, we saw you in Texas. We told you so. Uh, that things are going to change, and now we're, we're heading back home. Right. And by the way, we would by then also have our own airline, not their Facebook air, airline that they just introduced. That don't exist anywhere but Facebook. So please, uh, bro, thank you so much. I, I have to, you know, I have to ask your name again. Uh, robot, yes, really. My name is Omoyele, his own is Owoyele. They like, they like money more than they like Omoyele. <laughs> 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 like, 
you when, when you, when you have a very good Oma without money, <laughs> you can't do much. Right. So Oma and I will combine together now to make Nigeria great. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to recognize some people in our midst today. Um, like uh, our president have just said, we are still people of culture. Where there are elderly people, we must recognize them. Yep. If you look at it, if you look at this metroplex, this is just the beginning. All what you see today is an impromptu. It's within two weeks. And we said we will try our best. We will do it what we can. Yep. And we call around. And like I said earlier on, one of the planners of this event just lost his brother, his brother in law. And he's here wow. to see how much he loves Nigeria. I will come to him later. But the first one on my list, even one of my brothers that is so passionate about Nigeria, this is his brother-in-law, but we call him father. Because we don't use American way of English. You know, we don't have cousins and uncles. Everybody are brothers, right? Yes, right. We are all sisters. Yes, right. Because we are all brothers keepers. I will first of all recognize our father, Daddy Olatunji. Take it back. Action. Action. Take it back. Action. Amen. Then in our midst here, if you want to see one of the elderly people in this community that love Nigeria more than the youth, when I call him, he said, son, you know, I don't go to too many places, but I will be here. This one here is a man of God. You know they have Episcopal in America, yeah. and Episcopal is what in Nigeria? Anglican. Anglican. Mm. And then, when he said, we must have a church that we call our own. Mm. So they had to recruit him, those of you who are familiar with Ondo Town. Mm. Okay, as you can tell, I'm from Ondo, he's from Ondo. Mm -hmm. And then please don't take me on this. Our next president is coming from Mundo. Yes. So let us be proud of that. I have the honor to introduce to you. He's a reverend in the big cathedral, the biggest cathedral in Mundo State, before he moved to the United States. Our father, Reverend Felix, retired Reverend Felix Akikube. And then I'm going to introduce a, he's a young man when you see him. You think he's, he's still a boy. He's still dressed like a boy, but he, <laughs> when you see that man, he's over 60. Wow. He's not a boy. He didn't say much. When you use the word of action, we borrow that word from him. Mm. All he cares about is result. Yeah, right. He's a result-oriented man. <laughs> when we decided to build the best computer lab in one of the secondary schools in Ondo Town, he is the one that personally went to Nigeria, do all the connection and everything. If you think I'm lying, go to Jubilee Grammar School today. It's the best computer lab in Ondo State, period. Mm. Mm. I have the honor to introduce to you Brother Buzz. Mm. Thank you, Allah. Mm. You know all these people that I'm calling, those are my super house. These are the people I'm going to to get the money. These are the people that I know I'm going to get into their pocket. I'm a pickpocketer. <laughs> take but it back. For good. For take it back. Yeah. Then this man right here is a very quiet man. I'm not going to say much about him. Before <laughs> he can travel to Nigeria, he must take what we call security clearance. Mm. Now we speak volume. But he's involved in the community. He's most likely going to be the first African to be in the city of Arlington City Council very soon. Yeah. I have the honor to introduce to you Demola Adejoku. Please let's give him a round of applause. And this man here, we call him Uncle Bank. What is a bank? Money. 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 <laughs> so when you say Uncle Bank, Money, then you put uncle. So that means it's a bigger money. Yeah, right. Honorary bank is a bank. Yeah. But when you call it uncle bank, that means it becomes bigger money. Yeah. He is the one when I approach him, and um, our president have been.
to his printing shop before. Every poster we printed, every flyers we did, all these envelopes we did free of charge. Wow. And he promised me one thing, that the moment after October 7, you are no more a presidential aspirant, and you are a presidential candidate. You haven't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Take it back. Take it back, action. Take it back, action. And uh, I have the honor to introduce to you Uncle Bang. Fred, are you okay? There are other people that are well known in the community that are not here. We should remember that this weekend is a Labor Day weekend. Yeah. A lot of people have planned trips for the weekend mm -hmm. before we were being told to this, this fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, Adiola, there is one person, how can you do this to me, Dr. Fabi? This young lady here, you didn't even introduce her. <laughs> She'll be walking. Yes. This is the person that is in charge of the Global Fund. We are going to tell you about many ways we are raising the money. So those who cannot be here today, I promise you, I will give you the list of those names. Yeah. And you will see the money they will send to the bank account, wow. which is the Take It Back account in Bank of America. Yeah. Take It Back! Action! And then this is the beginning of the fundraising in the Metroplex here. Yeah. There are six geographical locations in America, like we have six geographical in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. We are going to replicate it here. State of Texas, we have probably the highest percentage of Nigerians today. Mm -hmm. Then Chicago, mm -hmm. then New York, mm -hmm. then DMV, yeah. which is the DC, Maryland, mm -hmm. and Virginia, mm -hmm. and then California. Yeah. We are going to, between now and December, we are going to enter into what we call fundraising competition. Yeah. Talk is cheap. Anybody can talk. Give the microphone to anybody. But put your money where your mouth is. And then when you see me, when I'm talking, you can tell me to shut up. But as long as you don't have money to keep me quiet, I will keep on talking until I get that money from you. <laughs> so please, let's go out there. Concert is coming. Big event is coming. And um, I know he has so much in his uh, play, but he he is, he's coming concert. back to Texas yeah. again. Yeah. Right. And then I can't go but just recognize three other people. Okay. You know, there is no way you can do it by yourself. And I have the honor to introduce to you the man that lost his brother-in-law. Mm. He's here today, Fidelix Agwebua. That's him right there. <laughs> for 37 years and I met him two years after he got to this country and this is my 35th year wow. he took me in we are brothers we build a relationship it's not just a brother relationship we are family today mm. there are some things I can tell you about what he has done for me what I have done for you it takes a village to raise a child it's going to take entire Nigeria to do what? To take Nigeria back. Yeah. Take it back. Action. Action. Take, take it back. back. And then another one is, I call him Omar Boro. <laughs> oh, jeez. Area father. He's the area father. He's the one in charge of the big one that is coming next. Of reason they are preparing for their harvest, he was unable to do much. And he told me, don't worry, I got your back. Yeah. I have the honor to introduce to you Tayo, the one to get. <laughs> Then the last person, before we do general introduction, pardon me. Um, this man here, our business is located in the same place. We talk about our country. Okay? Who can tell me the last country that the ex president was jailed recently? South, South Korea. South Korea. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. This man started the same movement like our driver started in Korea. When he was about to be killed in South Korea, he came to the United States. So when we were talking about governance, and I told him as I need you, and then I, I was a little bit surprised that our president didn't talk, didn't talk about our cardinal programs, the security and everything. He said, Within six months, 
we will produce how many megawatts of power? 40, 4,500 megawatts. Out of what? Out of solar. Solar. This man, his company is almost a Fortune 500 company. And he specializes in solar. Wow. He's here today. I have the honor to introduce to you Mr. Young at the back there. <laughs> and you know in their country they don't take corruption easily. So these are the people we are going to deal with. Those, those are not the Chinese that will still take money. And then they will give us what? Peg. They build us fake roads. When the road after six months, what happens when there is rain? It's washed away. Yes. <laughs> so we're looking forward to that. And then please, I will start from my right here to introduce yourself, sir. My name is Tyler. <laughs> Johnson or Latunji. My name is Mohammed Dwara. I'm from Gambia. Bartholomew Idemudia. Dele Ayinola. Bumi Olad enjoy. Well, that's my daughter. Wow. Wow. Look at that. That is, the, that is the first daughter of Nigerian born in the Metroplex here. Wow. That was 32 years ago. She's wow. part of the history. She For real? She's the one that yeah. wants to go back to Nigeria. She's recording. She wants to really, really go back to Nigeria. As you see her, she can speak Yoruba, she can speak Kondo dialect. Wow. Oh. So, and then please. We need to fix that country so that we can go back. Yeah. Yes. Pay money, baby. Oh, Fidel is our boy. Tayo, you want to Young Kim. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> CC Master Quad. And that lady, she's from Liberia. And no. she changed her citizenship to Nigeria. Woo! She's Sicilian, but she's not from Milayo. No! This is bad! Yeah. Kemi Akibobola. She's going to be a member of the fundraising team. Amen! Ademola Adetosoe. Ademola Adetosoe. Adebayo Frank Adetosoe. That's my son. He practiced. Ademola Oladunjuri. Frederick Adegoke. Felix Adegoke. Ademola Adejoke. Alami Deoguni. Oui, oui, you know that. Ah, you're too dear, you're too Nice. Francis Ibikule. Ah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you want me to tell the secret now. Yeah, yeah. 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 tell them. They've been coming together with our future presidents from secondary school. That's right. And I remember when he was here in May, he said something that I'm not going to repeat again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and in University of Lagos, they were together. That's right. Um, there is a Dallas group that is in existence. We are not a group. There is only one Dallas group. Yeah. We don't have two Texas. groups. Texas, only one. Because at the end of our contest, <laughs> we are going to beat all other zones. Yes. I can guarantee you that. Yes. Take that to the bank. Yes. <laughs> My name is Ola Olua Oladun. Oladun, I'm 
we know both of you now. <laughs> and then now we have to introduce you. Let me come and hold the camera and introduce yourself. Uh, <laughs> ah, no. yeah. You have to do that. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Adiola Davis, and I'm uh, part of the global fundraising team for the Take It Back movement. I specialize on online fundraising, digital, and um, non-traditional methods. Like, I'm the kind of person that calls someone like him up. Hey, I have two weeks. I need a fundraising event. <laughs> yeah. I need you to raise $10,000 for us because um, we have work to do. So I just want to say thank you all for coming. And um, just to the, when it comes to Nigeria, I have no shame. I am going to beg and beg and not let you go home. If you don't donate, I'll sit on top of your car. Drive me to the highway. <laughs> I have to do what I have to do. But thank you so much for coming. You really make my evening by putting those Benjamins in those envelopes. So thank you all. Thank you. Now, please, envelopes should be given out. Why you have the envelope, please be generous. It doesn't stop here. We are going to give you every information by the way you can donate. Go fund, you can do what we call is it Zilli Transfer Digital People I'm Analog. Yes, so, and um, I'm trying to convert to digital. So, uh, our future president is my digital conversion box <laughs> that is going to convert me to digital. So they said it's Zilli transfer. Zell. If no, you have the, huh? Zell. Zell transfer. You see why I'm, I'm, I'm analog? But I still do the old traditional way. Yeah. Envelope. Envelope. <laughs> on this envelope here, we have um, Omayele Shure. On your check, right where pay to take it back. And the envelopes are the back there, sir. Take it back. Then we have a platinum donor, a thousand dollars and above. Gold donor, five hundred dollars and above. A silver donor, two fifty and above. Bronze donor, hundred and above. And general donation, fifty and above. Let me tell you the significance of this. We are going to form a database. If you look at it now in America. Even today, I receive solicitation for money from the Republican and Democrat alike. They will say, they will collect your data. We want to reach out to you. We want to see what, we want, we want to let you see what your money is doing. And then please, when you rub my back, I will rub your back, not in a negative way. Because without the movement, the movement will not succeed without money, which is the gasoline that will power the car. Mm -hmm. So please, and then go fund, go to our party, um, our party website. All the information is there. The bank account is there, how you can donate. And then please, for those who are not here this evening, please let's try to reach out to them. Just write your name. Even if you don't have it here, you can put it as a flag, but please give me a correct phone number and email. Please. We want to make it happen. The goal they set for me, or for us, we Nigerians to raise tonight is about $10,000. And I know we are bigger than that. God will bless you all. Amen. Thank you very much. And um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sorry I came out here late standing before you with a little bit of a heavy heart, but we started this thing from the beginning and I wanted to see it to you. Okay? Um, while we don't mind accepting money that jingles, but we rather take the one that squeaks. Okay? And uh, in the bigger notes. So I really employ you to help us with this movement. Um, it's just starting and hopefully it will grow and grow to a bigger stage where we'll be proud of what we start. Okay? So thank you all for coming. 
and uh, we hope you contribute immensely. Thank you. Stop the very important work you are doing right now. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> which is, which is putting down the numbers with as many zeros <laughs> as possible. Yes, sir. Um, so again, we, we really want to thank you very much for for taking the time to be with us. Yele uh, Shoole has provided us with an overview, so he hasn't gone into a lot of detail. We've been, as he indicated. One of the things that uh, he indicated he wanted to do very early on in this movement and in this campaign was never to take the Nigerian people for granted. Campaigning for the presidency in Nigeria means, in normal times, going to a rally with thousands of people that you have paid to come there and not telling anybody what your plans are for the country. There would be songs, there would be dancing, umbrellas or brooms would be waved in the air, and then everybody goes back home. But, if you're going about the serious business of trying to lead a nation of almost 200 million people, one of the things he said early on, and we really caught him to, and it has been the, the driving force of the movement, is that the Nigerian people deserve town halls. That if you want to serve the Nigerian people, you must go to them and tell them what your plans are. And that if you want to serve the Nigerian people, you must be ready to stand in front of them and have them ask you what your service is going to be about. They have the right to ask you questions. They have the right to seek answers. So one of the cardinal things, and, and this has revolutionized the way politics is done in Nigeria. Nobody had ever seen it before. As she already indicated earlier, we have been to almost every single one of the 36 states and the federal capital territory in Nigeria. There have been town halls in over 60 cities around the world, majority of them in Nigeria. The other day we were logging how many kilometers she already had actually traveled. There is no, we, we, without any fear of contradiction, I can assure you that no one running for the presidency of that country has covered as many miles and has gone out to meet as many Nigerians as she already has done on this campaign. Absolutely not. And I think, quite frankly, that deserves a round of applause. Woo! And, it also, and, it also, and it also because it's because Nigerians deserve to know what anybody that wants to serve them, they deserve to know what your plans and your programs are. One of the questions we also used to get early on, that he used to get early on was, why are you bothering with people in diaspora? After all, you don't have PBCs. You are not going to be voting. So why, why is it bothering with people in diaspora? Apart from the obvious fact that those of us in diaspora are Nigerians, and regardless of where we are, whether it's in the United States or in the UK or in South Africa or in, in China or in Australia <laughs> or in Qatar, regardless of where we are, Nigeria beats in everybody's heart. I joke that where two or three Nigerians are gathered, they discuss Nigeria. That's the reality. So no matter how far we are from Nigeria, Nigeria is never far from our hearts. That's number one. Number two is there's a practical reason why you must go to Nigeria. One of it is what you're doing today. If that nation is going to change, the fuel that will change Nigeria is going to come from you. Every year, Almost $40 billion goes from where? From diaspora to Nigeria. 
The Nigerian budget, the annual Nigerian budget is $30 billion. We send more money to Nigeria than the national budget itself. But here's the other fact. There are 20 million Nigerians in diaspora. 20 million. There are 84 million registered voters. You may not have a PVC, but I assure you there are five people back home you can call. There are five people at a minimum back home you can call. The friend whose wedding you sponsored. <laughs> the nephew whose school fees you pay. The neighbor whose medical bills you pay for. The family members who hold you with a lot of respect. So you don't have a PVC, but there are five to ten people that have a PVC that you can call. You're not asking them for money. You're not asking them to buy you a car. You are talking to them about the future of the country and you are asking them for a favor. So even if they don't do it because, and you know, a lot of times we do things sometimes not because we, we fully, it's the person who asks you that makes you determine, you know, sometimes you do things just because the person who is asking you to do it, you hold that person with a certain level of respect. You understand that they are thinking it's, it's, it's the fact that they are concerned about that place and that thing and that there's nothing, they have no personal investment in it. That makes what they are requesting from you something that you consider even more significant. So here is what I dare to say. The 20 million Nigerians in diaspora control at least 100 million votes. So if you do nothing other than to pick up your phones, and at some point during this campaign, we're going to be coming back to you, and we'll be asking you for who those people are that you will serve as a reference for. That's why we go to you. That's why Shavore does double duty, campaigning in Nigeria and making sure, because if you are going to tell people back home to vote for Shavore, they will ask you why. Why him? So he has to come to you and explain to you why him. So that when you are asking them for that favor, you will be doing it with a conscience that's clear. You will know that you've looked this man in the eye and you've asked him those germane, pertinent questions that would have bothered you and that he has answered them to the best of his ability. So what we're going to do now is we will throw the floor open. I'm sure there are lots of people with, with questions. Um, it's, it's a town hall. Uh, there is, I think, a single microphone. Whoever has a question can, I think right now, can just uh, you know, raise your hands and walk up, sir. Please, sir. Yes, sir. First of all, I give glory to God Almighty for being here this evening. I have followed the history of this gentleman for a long time. I know the struggle during the Alimos school. When somebody invited me to this meeting, I called a friend of mine of my same age group. And he said I should tell this gentleman to go back to Nigeria to start from the local government level. Then I called him back two days later and told him about the history. When Obama came to the political scene of this country, I was one of the people that I told some people that he is a joker. Mm -hmm. That as a black man with a funny name, mm -hmm. nobody 
Nobody will work it for him at this age to become the president of the United States. I have been a Democrat all my life. But at that time, I called a friend of mine, Representative Lewis, some of you may know, yeah. yes. to beg him to talk to Obama to allow Hillary Clinton, and maybe Obama will be her vice president. Mm -hmm. But what God has disdained, what God has made, right. nobody can change. Mm -hmm. God made Obama the president of this country. Then people may look at this man and say, a young man with no experience. What can he do? I thank you. All of you. I'm ashamed to be in this country. I was educated in this country. I was here when, as a black man, you cannot enter a restaurant unless through the back door. Mm -hmm. Wow. I was here when Martin Luther King was killed. Mm -hmm. I was here when Kennedy was killed. I know the history of this country. Let me tell you. This man may not make it in 2019 unless God says it is his time. But don't let us, don't let this movement die. Yes. Martin Luther King started his movement at the age of 29. Or maybe 25. You know he died at the age of 39. Nobody believed what he did. But look at what that man has done for this country. He changed the face of this country and the history of this country. Therefore, if we don't make it in 2019, don't give up. Don't give up. <laughs> and I know if God wants to answer him, and answer the prayer of Nigeria. So, like I told the friend, well, we he will allow this man to become our president in 2019. Thank you, Bob. As some of you, many of you have said, no matter what, how long I've been in this country, no matter how God has blessed you with all the wealth of property mm. in this country, where two or three that they are gathered, mm -hmm. they will talk about Nigeria. Yeah. Yeah. This oh. evening, when I told my wife that I was coming to this, he said, this old man, when are you going to grow up? <laughs> <laughs> you should be tired now. And I told her, I said, Look, let me tell you, my dear. Home home. I love Nigeria dearly. That's right. But like I've said, each time I go to, I'm going to Nigeria, my children will say, uh oh, <laughs> you are going again. <laughs> but the moment I get, go get to the country at the airport, I wake up and change my ticket mm. and come back. Wow. My brothers and sisters, silver and gold, I may not have. But what I have, I will give it to you. If it is dying, I will die with you. And I know by the grace of God. We will make it. Amen. The president of the uh, former president of Ghana, Rolly, Jerry Rolly, said something to Return in this 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 evening about Nigeria. Mm. It's on what was that? Please read it. That is the Nigeria we are all craving for. That is Nigeria we are all praying for. Right. The 
bunch of thieves that, that, that are leading us now. They are disgrace to all of us. Disgrace to the marriage. Is it not a shame that Bukana Saraki wants to become the president of Nigeria? Let me leave you alone. I know that the grace of God we get to the promised land. Thank you so much, sir, for those uh, for those very staring, staring words. Um, so, anybody with questions? Yes, please. We have a, a question over here. security clearance. I remembered him. I know the whole stress. Uh, that was my last day with the U.S. Army. I wasn't a service person. I can never be a service person. But I worked with them in Uganda, East Africa for like 18 months or so. So if I could give so much effort to make America better, definitely why can't I do the same for Nigeria? I moved to the U.S. in 2010 and the first three months I was here, I was like, I made a mistake. I need to go back home. But every time I went back home, I'd give you a little story. I had a job off our NMPC and everything was fine. And they told, the person I interviewed me said, let's meet up somewhere. Salary was 800,000. I told me you're going to give me 500,000 out of that mm. every what? month. And I was like, how much is petrol every month? <laughs> I was going to be left. So anyway, fast forward. I was supposed to campaign in 2019. I moved to the local because I have a house of assembly. I've been working on this since 2011. I was supposed to be picked by AC, and then, as usual, Godfather, I didn't get a listen, stepped down for him, blah, blah, blah. 2019, basically, fast forward 2018, I went home and everything was all set and done, but just one meeting turned everything around. And I basically gave up and I packed up, I came back to America. Like, I wouldn't say I gave up on Nigeria, but my cousin used to say one thing a million of you, a million of me can change in Nigeria. I used to agree with that, but on Instagram, I used to see your videos. Initially, I said, I was like, what is it going up and down? That people that will change Nigeria, they are not your common. But mm. when I saw the reception and the followership you had, initially, I was like, wait, is this possible? Now, on my WhatsApp group, that we all are on different WhatsApp groups, I'm always like, if I'm going to vote here, yeah, definitely I'd give my vote to the right person. But the most important thing is, Selflessness is what we don't have in a bunch of politicians we have today. There are lots of things taking our resources away. The first question I want to ask is, what do you have to do about NYC? <laughs> it was set up by the man in that has never won his award in any election since it was released for a on job, but our youths are wasting away productivity. You said you want to increase the allowance. I don't think we should increase the allowance. Rather. Rather, I know I see, let's make it a vocational training. That's the first question aside. Then for the Senate, what do we have to do about them? The problem is not the president in Nigeria. Yes, he's not he's not really effective, let me put it that way, but the Senate and the House of Reps, what do we have to do about them? They, they, their corruption is legendary. It's beyond what we all know. <laughs> Sitting at our one salary, now they've been closed down for many months, they're still getting paid. Saraki is flying up and down, we are feeling he's just to campaign. Politicians are playing monkey post with us. Today they are in APC, the street sets, PDP versus APC, who's going to be next, we don't know. But my question is, it's not about age or not too young to run. It's about what's next after we, after we get there. We are tired of the same set of politicians being dry cleaned and brought out in different colors over the rear. To be able to the washing machine come out in a different color. But when we get there, we didn't ask for this in 2015, we just wanted to good luck out, it was a huge mistake. Now we've got to ask questions. 
it's not just about diaspora, it's not just about the future of Nigeria, it's not about winning this election. What are we going to do? Okay. The Israelites just wanted to leave Egypt. Just they didn't want to experience Pharaoh's horse with anymore. We're in that situation now. I was telling my friend, if you don't get it right this time, forget it, you can't get it right again. I agree with what our father said about really being willing to sacrifice anything, but the aftermath is my concern. I believe we will get there if we set our mind to it. But what what plans do we have? You've spoken, but some people might not have heard, but I just want people to know what you have in store for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I know it's uh, sort of getting very late, so I am conscious of that. And I want to thank uh, Baba for you know staring up uh, the space for us. You have said it all. Uh, you didn't ask any questions. You just motivated us to uh, a level that uh, we hope a lot of people are taking uh, notes about. When we do this, there are also a lot of Nigerians all over the world who are watching us. And they keep watching even after the broadcast is over. Uh, to your question about NYC, <laughs> I have an interesting experience with the NYC as well. I did my NYC. Uh, long story, but at this, as it is during our own time, it's, NYC is almost for punishment. Uh, and they will take us to the remotest part of the country dump you there so that you don't have any connection with activism. If you make any move, you, know, uh, you protest against the system, they come after you, you never get an NYC certificate. Uh, so, no, that's true. Uh, what um, I would do about the NYC is I would not make it compulsory anymore. So that if you want to go to NYC, you go. If you don't want to go, you don't go. The idea of making it compulsory is the reason why NYC is also an outlet for corruption. You know, up to the first experience I had in NYC camp is the outright stealing of cows that are made available to coppers in the camp. We're supposed to have two cows. They will kill it before we wake up. By the time we wake up, there will be nothing left of the meat. So. One day, I protested against in camp in Adama State, <laughs> and suddenly, the meat that had disappeared in the morning was brought back in the camp. So, throughout the rest two weeks we had in camp, we had enough meat that we would even call people from outside to come and eat. Just, you know, just took out, but before then, we would just discover that when they cook the soup, we don't know where the meat had disappeared to. <laughs> so there's corruption at all levels. But I'm telling you, but that's just not it. What about the purchase of the uniform, the boots? You know, the contracts are given to people in government who are contractors to the government that they are not supposed to, in, in which they're not supposed to be contract. Conflict of interest. Huge wastes for me, and I think for a lot of people. I'll tell you that I like NYC. I really, it made me see the other side of Nigeria. It made me feel that without it, I probably wouldn't have traveled to Adamawa State on my own. So it has that value, but it should not be compulsory. So that someone who don't want to do it should not be forced to do it. And those who want to do it, when they are doing it, they should be adequately remunerated. That's why we are proposing to pay them the amount of money you pay a minimum, a minimum wage for workers. And our minimum wage is hundred thousand naira, which is equivalent of three hundred dollars, by the way, uh, peanuts. But the copper should be able to pick the same amount of money that's the minimum wage for a civil servant. So that's our proposal. So that's my answer to NYC. I'm not going to scrap it, but I will not make it compulsory, and we'll do that very quickly. So that if you school abroad and you don't want to do NYC. That's the choice. If you want to do it, that's the choice. We also have proposed an insurance scheme for NYC participants so that if people go do it and anything happens to them while they're doing it, they get paid 10 million naira. Yeah, Take care of whether you're disabled, I mean, you experience disability or debt in the cost of serving 
your country. All right? So, and that's not bad. Considering that the thieves who don't do anything take more money every year at the Senate and the House of Reps. Those guys are not serving anybody. They are serving, they are serving, they are serving the devil. And we pay them for it. Uh, so, regarding the question about what we tend to do, by the way, if you want to come back to Nigeria and run in your part of the world, you no longer need APC you know, because that drug has expired now. And or PDP, you can come to AAC and you get a ticket uh, on our platform. We, we, we can guarantee you that. So, feel free to buy a ticket and come back home. I also wanted to address the issue of having PVC. Since we started this movement, we have seen a surge in Nigerians going back home to register, by the way, and they are planning to go and vote, even if it's symbolically against the system. Because one of the things we did, our movement did, was to fight INEC to extend the registration uh, period for voters by two weeks. It's ending, I think, tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow is uh, so, <laughs> interestingly, the political parties in Nigeria who are who benefit most from PVCs or I mean voters, they didn't protest with us. The PDP didn't ask to protest. The APC did not participate in the protest. But now we have been able to create a venue for a lot of people, and a lot of Nigerians have returned home to go and register. We know a lot of our friends who went from South Africa, the US, and they now have uh, their... First you get the TVC, which is a temporary voter's card, and then you get the PVC later. A lot of Nigerians have never voted before, because there's nothing to vote for. Yep. But this time around, there's something to vote for, and there's something to vote against. That's right. Yes. So a lot of people have uh, collected their PVC. Last thing you asked the question about what we want to do for Nigeria. Quickly, you probably have heard about our 10-point agenda, which is to make security a priority. Power, 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 electricity. I cannot say enough of that. Because without getting that particular department right, forget it. We will continue to be an impotent nation without electricity. There's no way we can kickstart our economy without power, electricity. And I keep telling Nigerians, you cannot have electricity as long as you are voting for generator contractors. Right? It's not going to happen. So the next one is we want to have infrastructure. One of the things we're discussing our way from the airport today with uh, Robert is that whenever America has any kind of economic downturn, you notice what they do? They invest in infrastructure. You just see that suddenly they are rebuilding a bridge that there's nothing wrong with. Because that is how they put in more money in the pockets of their own people. They create employment for young people. And they, by extension, also fix their infrastructure. In America, when I did my master's degree, one of the case studies we did in one of my classes, they built a bridge to nowhere, I think in Alaska. You know, the, the, the one congressman or senator just asked for a bridge to be built. They asked him, where is it going? <laughs> There's nothing. Because they have this desire to keep infra the infrastructural system going. You can travel from New York to Dallas, and there's a road that will take you there. You cannot travel from Lagos to Ibadan, and there's a road that will take you there. I spent six hours two weeks ago in traffic within the space of two kilometers between Lagos and Ibafo. Any one of you know that road? Yeah. Yes. When we got to the place that created the traffic, it was just a turning. Other countries would have created a bridge. There will be, you know, Overhead. there will be uh, bypass. bypass. So, you know, you create bypass, you create layover, lay I mean, like flyovers just to avoid. In Nigeria, Probably between Lagos and the Bible, there's only one bypass, and it's you know that's the Shagamo. No, no, there's only one. There's an express flyover, the one that's connecting Shagamo to, and I think there's another one near Peru or somewhere. And these things are 40 years old, 
and there is no plan anywhere to do a new one. That's Nigeria for you. So infrastructure is key. I'm just giving that example so that you understand the importance. Because without the integration that we need, interestingly, and I say this because I'm a geographer, I studied geography in my, as my first degree. The size of Nigeria has not been bigger since Nigeria was created. We have not acquired extra land <laughs> since 1960. It's the same place. It's just more people within Nigeria. But Nigeria hasn't developed its infrastructure in a long time. We haven't done any major highway in Nigeria since I was an adult that is up to 100 kilometers long. They might launch it too. They will go there, do their fanfare. They will launch it with big abada. They will even put a block there, cut ribbon. But no button is never done. It's the same way everywhere. So infrastructure is key. We're going to fight corruption. But it's not just mountain that you fight corruption. For me, the way to fight corruption is to make it impossible for people to steal. The moment people steal, it's difficult to even collect it back from them. It's the way some of you have, some of you work in city councils in America here. You don't have the, the way, the, there's no way in the world that there are no thieves. As I tell people, the most corrupt street in the world is in New York, Wall Street. Mm -hmm. But the system is such that they don't make it available for you to be able to grab the money is available in the city council. Otherwise, the city mayors will be stealing in this place too. They are human beings. Anywhere money is available, people will steal it if it's freely available. Even sometimes they will steal and damn the consequences later. But in Nigeria, we don't even have ways, for example, of you know doing contracting in a way that it can be done electronically. Payment is done electronically so that you can pay. We went to the University of Ibadan when we wanted to have a rally, I mean, a town hall meeting. We had to take the cash to the cashier of the university. You know, as soon as they have a bucket there, they dip it in the money, they are still counting. I said, the University of Ibadan in 2018, you are still using hand and bucket to count money. If the cashier has that money with him and he has problem at what stops him from stealing the money? But if you can do it in such a way that the cashier has no contact with cash, it will be difficult to steal it. So, and we have the infrastructure already to prevent corruption on the scale that is happening in Nigeria, or to track money so that we know where our money has gone on a daily basis. If you are here in the city, this city can tell you by 12 noon how much they have made from taxes. Mm -hmm. By 12 midnight, they also know how much they have made from taxes. It's because it's all centralized and doing they are doing it digitally electronically to make sure that they know where their money is and they also know how they are spending their money part of the biggest problem with corruption in nigeria is the opaque nature of governance everything is hidden everything is secret in this town if i want to find your address i only need to type in your name into the database of the property uh, uh, thing or your, the way you are paying taxes. I can find it even if I'm based in Nigeria. There is no database of properties in Abuja. Anywhere that you can find it's hidden. And if we were to know who, are, who owns properties in Abuja, we will know where to find the thieves. We will know where the thieves are spending their money. We don't know, we don't have a database that is public of companies in Nigeria. That is why sometimes you cannot, you will find out that the contract of 9 billion to 10 billion naira is offered to a company and you find the chairman of the company is a nine year old boy. <laughs> it's Nigeria. But in the UK, there's the UK property information available online. The same thing with the US. If I come to Dallas today, I want to find a company belonging to uh, Francis. I, if I type in in New York, I'll find Francis' company. So, all those things are things that we have to do. Transparency is very important. The next thing is, of course, our economy, because I'm sure you hear that a lot. People make it so interesting to you that all the time, a Nigerian economy is always about something that is not related to Nigeria. 
mostly the foreign reserve <laughs> of Nigeria. You know, if you ask President Buhari today, how is the economy? You say, well, as foreign reserve is growing. But one thing they taught me in mathematics is that before you can discuss how much you have in your pocket, we must first of all deduct your debt. And when you look at Nigeria, it's going since good. since the last three years, I think they've, they've, they've borrowed off almost $22 billion. But they will be parading to you $47 billion in foreign reserve. If you minus $22 million from $47 uh, billion, what do you get? Nothing. And what is foreign reserve? It's a question you should ask yourself. Foreign reserve is a credit card for rich people. Yes, it's the cash that is used to back consumption that is coming from abroad. And who are the people eating or consuming things from abroad? It's not the regular people. And it's not you. Because you are paying, you are even paying Nigeria for living, for being a Nigerian citizen. We are the most overtaxed people who are Nigerians, Nigerians living abroad. It may not have come to you as a tax, but any time you have to wake up in the night sweating to go and send $100 to somebody in Western Union, through Western Union, Western Union is taxing you and you also tax yourself because you don't have to send the money. So your relationship with Nigeria becomes Western Union. And that relationship is very transactional but compulsory. Because you know how it is. If you don't send that money, people are going to be sending you prayers through WhatsApp. And when you know you are not sending money, they will be sending you proverbs from home. You know? So it is where we are. Our economy is not working for us because we really, in the real sense of it, don't have the basis to call ourselves an economic powerhouse. Because we don't even have anything working for us that could make us be called an economy that works. We don't produce, we don't manufacture, we don't have electricity. Even when people want to do things on their own, they have no means of doing it. Movie makers in Nigeria have to go to the Republic to start and complete the editing of films. I'm not making these things up. So when you hear them talking about the economy, you laugh at times. What is it that <laughs> one of them even had the audacity to go and recalibrate the Nigerian economy the other day and say it's bigger than South Africa? And I said, have you been to South Africa? How can your economy be bigger than South Africa? When South Africa has 60,000 megawatts of electricity, you have 3,500 megawatts of electricity. Have you ever seen South African highways? You're right. Do you have you ever been to South African universities? Go to every even the neighborhoods in South Africa that are considered horrible. They have they have uh, uh, stop signs. They have uh, you know uh, uh, traffic lights. They have hot and cold water. So how can you recalibrate or you know recalculate your economy and say that it's bigger than South Africa? Stupid. So the next thing, brother, is restructuring. One other thing people ask about us from us all the time is restructuring. And we want to restructure Nigeria. The reason we must restructure Nigeria, Nigeria is like a vehicle. Every vehicle that has lasted for so long needs to visit the mechanic. Mm -hmm. That's for us is what restructuring is about. But we always say, and we have maintained consistency, and nobody has been able to knock this out in our own argument that Nigeria cannot be restructured by the same people who destroyed Nigeria. It's not possible. It's not only about being old. <laughs> it's about the fact that if you, all you have done in your life is restructure Nigeria into your pocket, it's not possible for you to wake up one day and decide that you want to restructure it in other people's pocket. So we are highly suspicious of the proponents of restructuring and their own brand of restructuring they want to do tonight. So we say to ourselves, we are the young people. We are at least intellectual enough. We are focused enough. We are exposed enough to restructure Nigeria in the way that will work for us in the 21st century. Let us do it ourselves. As the universe will always say, Urishabu live with me, So let us restructure Nigeria on our own. Eh? <laughs> 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 they say the gods 
the, the Yoruba God says that if no, if the gods cannot save me, let them leave me the way I am. Sorry about that. Yeah, you know I speak outside too. Yes. So and like you, you're right. Restructuring means so many things to so many people, and for some people, also this is this reason why the restructuring argument becomes superfluous by some people and to some people because. You cannot even find a united position of restructuring. For some people, restructuring means that they want to leave Nigeria because Nigeria is no longer working for them. For some people, it is the regionalization of Nigeria in such a way that each of the regions will go back to where we are before. But if you ask people, the people of Ekiti, do they want to come back to Ibadan? No. Again? Apparently, no. In fact, the people in Akure Kiti don't want to come back to Akure again to come and be governed by uh, Undo people because they are tired of the way they write petition. They have already left them behind. You understand? Know, them back. You understand? So, for some other people are saying that restructuring means that each of the regions will also grow at their own pace. At the end of the day, even a restructured Nigeria will still need honest, capable leaders. Even if Nigeria were to break apart today, each of the new republic will still need good people to govern so that they can have progress and peace and prosperity. Finally, and I say this all the time, if Nigeria breaks apart or we restructure and one side is prosperous, and the other is not. You think the side that is not prosperous will be watching the people that are prosperous? And you know, they'll just be looking. So they look at uh, the Southeast, so they enjoy for there. But are you going to construct walls around the place? Everybody will bombard the place. <laughs> will be sad now. And we be sad. <laughs> as, as good, as great as the American Army, you know, Marines and, 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 and customs are, when the people want to come with hunger from Cuba, you can't stop them. They will go and inflate tires, put their children and push it, so you start going to Florida. They know when the current is going in that direction. So, Talkless of Nigeria that is just land, it's the same people. So you now say that, okay, now, you know, there's employment in Enugu, plenty of great jobs, and then there will now be a toll gate that be in Indonesia. And you say, oh, you cannot enter. One day they will just go and bring bazooka, and they will everybody there. It's, it's as simple as that. All of you have heard about the gold rush in the US. Yep. It was driven by a rumor. That there's gold in the West. But most of the people that came looking for that gold never found a dust of gold. Some of them were there. When they heard about the gold rush, even the people that were physically disabled asked them to carry them. Everybody that had a knife was going to. When they eventually got there and they couldn't find gold, that was why they started naming it Wild Wild West. Because there's so much arms that come with the hope. Because everywhere you have resources, people will go there and look for it. Nobody can stop them. This is the reason why Nigerians are heading to Europe, passing through Libya. Most are knowing that they cannot make it past the Mediterranean, but they will still get on those rickety boats. Because there's a promise on the other end of a good life. Well, imagine that we can create a Nigeria where the next set of refugees from the West are looking to go to Nigeria to look for great jobs. That's the country that we need to create, and it is possible. Yes, what is annoying to me all the time, the reason I cannot stop and I cannot rest, is knowing the possibility of a powerfully great Nigeria. I know it, I, understand. I know it that Nigeria can be such a fantastic place. And I know that we have people that can make the place work both inside and outside. I know that if today Nigeria is even slightly like Ghana, we will have the infusion of professionals who are doing so well who will just make Nigeria become the next India where you want to go and find doctors. You'll be the next 
place where you want to go to university. By the way, Nigeria used to be like that. Nigerian doctors used to be the doctors that treated the royal family in Saudi Arabia. Nigeria used to pay salaries of civil servants of places including Cuba. The Nigerian Naira, according to Roberts today, told us that they used to accept the Nigerian Naira in place of the U.S. dollar. They would say, bring me Naira. Because the value of the Naira used to be greater than that of the dollar or the, U I mean, or the pound. That was Nigeria before. But the moment the bastards inside the place grew up, <laughs> they put down the place. That's the truth. And they are still there now. So, I just wanted to elaborate more. The rest is to deal with health, uh, education, agriculture. We have plans to do tourism. Because think about tourism, for example. Young people in Nigeria have grown the music industry to something else without the help of government. They've grown the movie industry to something else without the help of government. They are also growing technology into something else without the help of government. So imagine that you can find young people who can grow governance into something else with the help of all of you. That is why we are here and we hope you continue to support this dream. And as Marco mentioned, you have five people at home in fact, we are going to develop on our website a form that you can fill. We want you to give you, we want you to give us five names on the internet that we can call in Nigeria to vote for us. Because you will hear them saying that, oh, you didn't tell us of your candidates. Now you tell them of the of your candidates and you ensure that they vote for your candidates. Right? Because for so long we have been voting for their candidates because we don't vote for the right people. And that's very important that we put pressure on them. And I guarantee you, based on our travels at home, I have met people in Zanfara who told me, oh, Mr. Shore, my brother told me about you in London that you are running in Zanfara. Yes, it's true that the people in diaspora are actually reaching home. And some of them say that they are even threatening them. <laughs> that you don't vote for this is our guy. No, we are not hearing from anytime soon again. <laughs> so, <laughs> whatever you are doing is doing my, but I don't want you to threaten anybody with the economic sanctions. <laughs> but whatever you are doing is, is, is having a lot of impact, and we hope you continue to, to do that. We have a chance to change Nigeria this time around. And I'm afraid that if we lose this chance, we are not going to get it right for a while. Because these people will regroup if they don't lose this election. You see, this man that they are planning to vote back into office, they know that he won't last. I'm not saying in terms of like, I don't, I'm, not the, I'm not his creator, right? But it's clear that his battery is running very low. But they want to just manage him until after the election, and they know that after the election, he will probably run out of gas. But the cabal now will now take over Nigeria. And cabals are very dangerous because they are not answerable to anybody. You didn't vote for cabal, but cabal can ruin your life. And we've seen a lot of cabals come and go, and we see the damage that they've done to Nigeria. Don't let them come back and do it again. I think there's We'll take one more, one last question. I think do you want you have a question? Yes, come. Okay, uh, thanks for uh, coming tonight. Uh, I really appreciate Mr. Oyale inviting me. My quick question is to fix Nigeria problem, I think is both top down and bottom up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have all these people in power that are stealing money, but the poor people are also very corrupt. I'm not gonna lie to you, I've been to Nigeria and I've seen so many things. Also, I've been to several conferences where, uh, security conferences where they start with Nigeria. It's very distressing. And also I have privilege to be at the FBI Citizen Academy where they were showing uh, videos 
of Nigerian youth, how they steal money and all those stuff. So I believe there is two things, top down and bottom up. What programs do you have uh, to change the orientation of the youth, the way they think? Because these days, the youth are much, much, they are much as corrupt with fraudulent activities as the leaders. Thank you. Thank you. And there's another question at the back. Maybe we just take yours and take all of the questions at once. You can either come or if you understand that you have a loud voice, you can just shout. No, he has to come to the mic because okay. of the live feed. Sorry. Yes, you have to appear in our a, a broadcast. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. President, <laughs> um, first and foremost, I just want to use this opportunity to, from the bottom of my heart, call on all Nigerians, if you are watching anywhere, that it's all you safe. You won't introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say Mr. Yes. I just completed my PhD in Concordia yeah. University in Montreal, so I just, I will, when we organize it from Montreal, I took out of my time, even proud to my defense, to make sure that we add it and it was on a Sunday, and I'm happy even though, you know, that we are all here today. Please, it's not just in those end here. We have to ring it out loud. The dream must come true because for so long, a lot of us are suffering. And I'm saying this when I go to the YMCA refugee camps in Montreal and it pains Nigerians are going through. What I passed through, going through schools to get to get a degree. And I tell you, when I see people from maybe other countries in the world that they are making good use of their oil money, they want to win from Nigerians. Mm. They send their students abroad, everything, tuition be paid. Insurance. You only have health insurance be paid. And then there's a student that just came in and to study nanotechnology and this guy had to be doing all jobs just because to you know make do to get his PhD. Or I was like I was leaving him, I was crying for him. I had to give him out some of my things. Please, youth. And what drives me more insane is that we have psychopaths and in that system. A <laughs> over 80 still thinking to run again and what is wrong with us? Please, if you got all, all you can you can do it. You know, if you don't have, I don't. I know some people may not have money or anything. Use your voice. Join the group. Say it out loud. And by God's grace, He will make our man, this great man, our next president. Wow! Thank you. Take it back. Action! Action! Take it back. I will thank you very much and congratulations on uh, the completion of your PhD. Mm -hmm. See, Another doctor. And it wow. also breaks my heart to know that Nigeria has got very sharp people, but it's ruled by dumb people. Mm -hmm. That's the saddest part for us. Um, so, the question uh, I brought up, and uh, you know, I, I want to congratulate you in advance. I know you'll win your, your election too, and we'll celebrate with you next time we'll see you as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, regarding the bottom up and top down measures to deal with corruption and fraud in Nigeria. The way I understand it is that without dealing with the guys at the top first, Nigerians must see that there are consequences for being corrupt. We must make example of the guys at the top first and yeah. foremost. And if you do that, the guys at the bottom would 50% sit up. You know, if they can see that a Saraki can go to jail for corruption, and actually stay in jail, or a former governor can go to jail and is not rewarded with being a senator. If all the senators we have are former governors who have been indicted or cited with corruption are sitting in jail, as opposed to sitting in the Senate, young people will start to change. You know, there's a way that consequences make people behave very well. And you will know this by growing up, right? that the way our parents train us to be good is that you have a bad guy in the village and a good guy and they ask you to choose which one you want to be but now if you grow up in a village where there are no good people where do you choose from 
and that's where Nigeria is right now. So the other part of it is also reorientation, you know, but this orientation also has to come from even our own education systems. Our education system doesn't even exist in a way that even can allow you to have an orientation that is right because most people today in Nigeria who are in our education system are also cheating through the education system. People will have others write their wire for them and then when they get to the university, they have their own professors writing for them or professors sleeping with students before they give them marks. The system is so rotten. But I guarantee you, the solution number one for Nigeria's reorientation is to have the top fixed first. As long as the head of the fish is rotten, there's no way the body can move. No. And that is, all these things you see with FBI, we also have similar situations like that in the U.S. as well. There are a lot of young people too in this country who are rotten. But you can also tell that law enforcement is out there to take care of them. That's what I'm talking about, consequences. It's the same way in most cases, I don't say in all circumstances because I would be a little naive and ignorant to say. But you see that to a large extent, the governor of a state who is involved in corruption will be treated the same way a guy who is involved in credit card fraud is treated in this country. And don't get me wrong, not all the time, but at least you can tell that there's something out there that is actively working to stop and prevent people from the waywardness that they would like to, uh, I mean, what, what they like to become. I mean, the way not to drive this further is that if you permit me, I want to change the top first. And then the bottom, in my view, will start to fall in place. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's what I know about Nigeria. What you are talking about, the rot in Nigeria by poor people, is true. But most of the corruption at the lowest level is survivor-based corruption. Mm -hmm. The one at the highest level is greed. Just pure, wicked greediness of the type that is only genetically applicable to some people. So I just believe that if we get it right at the top, you know, the poor people at the lowest level will start to change. But it also has to do with a lot of programs because you cannot expect people to change when they can't find jobs. The young people in Nigeria are getting to a point where they are becoming emboldened by even the Yahoo Yahoo they do that they are having the streets named after them. Yes, they are becoming deacons in churches. They are having musicians worship them. So it's getting to a point where internet fraud that you are trying to refer to is becoming a norm in Nigeria. It's scary. Because even if you go to a club in Lagos on this Friday night, the section of the guys who are doing fraud is the one that is most protected. Protected not by themselves, but by the Nigerian police. Most of those internet fraud stars have police escorts. In fact, they have better escorts than some public officials in Nigeria. So they have better escorts than, you know, educational institutions that are even vulnerable to kidnappers and all other kinds of criminal gangs in the country. So, but let's get the top right, and I guarantee you that that discipline will start to sit to the bottom. You know, one thing I will tell you finally about Nigerians is that <laughs> the moment Nigerians know that the leadership is serious, you'll be surprised how they start behaving all right. And we know that by way of when they travel abroad. You can find a Nigerian who is wayward, reckless in Nigeria. The moment they go to a society where things are working, when they get to traffic light, they will stop. Yes, <laughs> they will stop. They will wait for the traffic lights. But when they get to Lagos, it's a different place. You understand? So that's it. Again, I want to thank every one of you for coming and staying with us until this moment and for supporting and contributing. Continue to support our movement, continue to support our political party, continue to support us until we 
change Nigeria completely. And we are not talking about the chicken fraudulent change they did in 2015, but this time the real revolutionary change that is coming next year. Thank you so much. Well, before we round it up, um, we've said all we need to say. The tray is going around, please. We need Thank your donation. Then I want to give you this information. If you have pen, you can write it down. But if you don't, go to our website, www.aacparty.org. All the information, how to support us. Many people, they call me there. They said they've already donated a gold fund. Most of those donations, we have the record. Please go up there. Do transfer, the bank account is there. Do, um, if you have your raw cash here, your check today, please she's going to run. We need it, we need your support. You see those traveling around, tomorrow morning, he will be leaving here to Canada. From Canada to Nigeria, and Nigeria back to LA, San Diego. The flights are not cheap. So, on behalf of the community of Dallas and state of Texas, we just want to thank you. Thank you, our mother, for coming. I know you work very late. You have to go change quickly. You see, we can out here. And we go continue to bless you. Doc, you see, have something to say? Um, yes. So, we, I will allow Doc to come forward to run it up for us. Then we have about 15 minutes. Please, we have some heavy food back there with water tape with you. They will be leaving out here shortly. So once again, thank you everybody for, for coming out. Uh, we appreciate uh, your sacrifice, your commitment. Um, as um, you were told earlier, our party website is www.aacparty.org. Uh, please go there, check it out. We want you to take your support all the way. Register as members of the party. Um, for those who want to run for office, look, angels are not going to come from heaven to serve. It is going to be people like you and I that will make that difference. So if you know good people in Nigeria that are politically inclined, that are interested in politics, that have always wanted to serve, and the only challenge they've had is they never had a platform, to talk to them. So, yes, if Shore is the president of the country, there are still about 109 people that we need in the Senate. We need about 360 people in the House of Reps. The only way Nigeria is going to truly change is both from the bottom up and from the top down. We need good presidents, good senators, good members of the House of Reps, good members of the state houses of assembly, good LGA chairpersons, good councillors. So go online, nomination forms are there. If you know people back home that are politically inclined, let them know that there's a party that has no need for godfathers, where you have democratic primaries that can determine who the representatives are. So once again, thank you very much. We will continue to count on you for support. We have your names, your contact details. Please, we will continue to reach out to you. Thanks again for everything that you've done and for what you continue to do for us. Take it back. Action. Take it back. Action.